If you were to design and build an aircraft, you would have a group of engineers working on the wings, another group of engineers and designers working on the fuselage, another group on the tail section, another group looking at the landing gear, the avionics, the interior of the aircraft, and so forth. All of these groups would have a common goal, and when I say common goal, I mean how far does this aircraft need to fly, and what's the payload? How heavy is it, and how large is it? What's the volume and mass? Are we carrying people or fuel or cargo or what? Now, this would be an iterative process. If you know the, the weight of the payload, you can kind of guesstimate the overall weight of the aircraft. That gives you an idea of the lift, the aerodynamic lift that's needed, that the wings are going to have to generate. That gives you an idea of what the drag is going to be, what is the drag that the uh, wing, the aerodynamic surfaces are going to create as well. If you know the drag, that gives you an idea of the thrust that you need. How much thrust is the propulsion going to need? And so on and so forth. How much fuel is then going to be needed? And so forth and so on. So it's an iterative process between these different groups. There's communication going on between the groups. A lot of thinking going on about the physics and the modeling and the way that these different subcomponents -com work. Each group is an expert, has expertise in the individual uh, subcomponent. So uh, iteration, communication, expertise, thinking, rationale. What if you didn't have one of those? What if you didn't have the common goal? What if there was no payload, the payload was unknown or the range was unknown? Well, it wouldn't work very well. On the other hand, you've got all this expertise. Uh, somebody just says, well, uh, we're gonna make the wings like this. Well, okay, that's gonna mean this and that. I suppose the system could work. You'd converge on some sort of a design that might work. It's kind of flaky. Um, what if you didn't have the communication between the different groups? So they were all working completely independently. Well, now this is getting kind of silly. It's just not going to work at all. What if you didn't have the rationale, the, the, the knowledge base, the physics knowledge, uh, the subcomponents, how they work? What if you didn't know any of that? Well, this is just getting absurd. Well, that's what evolution is. Evolution has none of those things that we normally think of that we use in the design process. Evolution has random mutations. That's it. You have random mutations and then hopefully once in a while you'll have a random mutation that is good, that's helpful, and then that leads to more progeny, more a differential reproduction, the reproduction of more kids that we're going to carry on with that mutation. And so that mutation will take over. That's the natural selection process. That's all you have. You don't have any of those other things. Everything we know about biology tells us that's not going to work. It, there's no scientific evidence that this process is going to work. Now, what evolutionists will say is, oh, wait a minute, that's, that's, that's not how it works. You don't, you don't build an aircraft uh, out of thin air. Uh, you don't build a cell or a species out of thin air. The way evolution works is it's a gradual process. It builds up. That doesn't help the problem any. It, in fact, it creates more problems. Um, and I won't go through all those problems on this video. But just as an example, one problem is that we don't observe a gradual continuum of species in biology nor do we observe a gradual continuum of the subcomponents of those species. Everything from the organs down to the molecular machines, the proteins, the DNA, we don't see a continuum, we see gaps. We see specific types. We don't see a continuum. That's what you would have to have for this gradualism, evolution's gradualism, to work. You need to have a continuum. There's no scientific evidence for that continuum. So there's all kinds of problems in biology that exhibit this. And you can see papers on this over and over again. And evolutionists are struggling trying to make this fit the scientific evidence while the scientific evidence, in fact, contradicts the theory over and over again. Uh, a paper came out a few days ago that we'll look at in this video on the, ev the evolution of sexual reproduction. So let's have a look at this paper here. First, we'll start with the PR piece for the paper, and then we'll have a look at the paper itself. I'm just gonna make some general comments on it. I won't go through all the gory details because it falls apart so quickly, but I'll make some general comments to give you an idea. 
So let's have a look at the PR piece. Novel hypotheses that answer key questions about the evolution of sexual reproduction. Well, sexual reproduction is a problem for evolution. As I just mentioned, it's one example of many problems for evolutionary theory. There is no scientific evidence that sexual reproduction evolved. And even the evolutionists have to admit that this is an enigma. It's a big mystery. The evolution of sexual reproduction in living beings is what? One of the biggest mysteries in biology. So this is a problem for the theory of evolution. And in fact, there are also many questions that are still unanswered. It's not like it's got solved by this paper. The biggest question, skipping down here, the biggest question in the study of the evolution of sexual reproduction is the question of cost. And so the question of cost is center to this paper that we're going to be looking at. Sexual reproduction requires exponentially more energy than asexual reproduction. So this is a central, central piece of the problem. Now they used computer modeling. I point that out here. So it says here the hypotheses, they come up with a couple of hypotheses and they tested them, how? By computer modeling. When, when you see that computer modeling, that's a tip off that this is going to be a just so story. Computer modeling in evolutionary theory is very high level and things just happen. Uh, not a lot of detail is included typically. And so we'll see that here. The first individual to have a sex controlling gene that allowed for meiosis to occur produced four gametes. Only gametes with the sex controlling gene could fuse, fixing it in the population and erasing the cost of meiosis. Well, wait a minute, this is very, very um, phenomenological, very high level. Uh, for example, how does this gene evolve? Well, that's not ex that, that the details of that are not in the simulation. It just arises. You you just have the sex controlling gene. There's no evidence that protein coding genes can evolve by random mutation. In fact, I'm putting it kindly. There's a uh, tremendous amount of hard science that shows that you can't blind random mutations um, do not create protein coding genes. It's just not going to happen. It contradicts evolutionary theory. Skipping down to the second hypothesis that they developed and presented in the paper uh, toward the bottom of this paragraph, then the male gametes reduced in size to fertilize more female gametes, depending on the inflated female gametes to provide the resources for survival. Do you see the teleological language? I hope you notice the infinitive forms here to fertilize and to provide the resources for survival. This is all teleological language. This is phony science. So here is the paper and skipping down to the abstract again back to the uh, ad admission that this is a major problem. This is an enigma for evolutionary biology, still unsolved and so forth. And yet, and more teleological language. Multicellularity increased the reproductive investment of both mates, resulting in excessively large isogametes. This redundancy induced cheating of one sex to reduce gamete size, to reduce the infinitive form there. When you see that, that's a tip off of teleological language, not to mention this, this notion of making investments. And yet more skipping down, the other sex allowed this cheat because her cost did not change. So you allow it, kind of an intelligent agent here, making decisions, allowing things to happen. Skipping down, this evolutionary problem has been considered a paradox. We talked about that and more teleological language. To compensate for this cost, sexual organisms have to leave two times as many offspring as asexual rivals. But this, is a but this is difficult in most species. So to compensate, more teleological language, more infinitive forms, and more mysteries. Why females make sons is a mystery. More problems for evolutionary theory. And here we have another statement about investments. This would be a valuable investment because it would significantly increase offspring survival and would eventually induce the evolution of more complex organisms, teleological. This is way in the future. So something is happening here. Evolution is creating something. And then much later in evolutionary history, you'll have the evolution of more complex organisms. So it's an investment, investment in the future.
This is teleological, like building the aircraft. You are making investments, you are making plans, you're thinking about that goal, that mission. How far must the aircraft fly? What is its payload? Okay, we need to do this and that and this and that. Planning ahead, doing things to achieve a goal that will only happen when we put all this together. That's teleological. This passage here is teleological. This is phony science. And as we saw in the PR piece, they used a simulation, a computer simulation, where you can make things up, you can make things happen at will, you just write the code and genes appear, things happen. Skipping down now, the benefit of fertilization assurance would lead to the evolution of a very large number of sperm, and reading on, therefore, isogamy would not be sustained in large fertilization spaces, instead, a higher degree of anisogamy must have been selected. Now, what I, the point I want to make on this sort of language, you should see a red flag come up when you read this sort of language. The idea here is that with evolutionists, this is this logic is is very common in evolutionary in the evolution literature and evolutionary thinking. If something has a benefit, it will evolve. The problem of how you actually would get those mutations and how many mutations are required and how unlikely that is, how astronomically unlikely that is, never enters the view, never enters the evolutionist's thinking. It's all about, oh, it's going to provide a benefit, therefore it will evolve. So with that in mind, let's read this again here. The benefit of fertilization assurance would lead to the evolution of a very large number of sperm. In other words, gee, if we had a very large number of sperm, then you'd get this benefit of fertilization assurance. Therefore, that's they evolved. That's that's why they evolved. Uh, no, no, uh, no consideration of the problem of how that would actually evolve and what mutations are required. Same thing with this next sentence here. I'll I'll skip over this. Now, skipping down, egg size has been optimized via size number trade-offs. Now, when they say has been optimized, I hope you, you can see what they're talking about is the evolutionary process. An active voice would read something like this. Evolution has optimized the egg size via a size number trade-off. Okay, so evolution did this. Now, you'll, you'll see this sort of language as well. The a evolution goes around doing these things. And they could explain this, but the problem is evolution, in, in, in evolutionist minds, um, evolution is a very imperfect process. In fact, that's one of the strongest arguments for evolution, is how cruddy this world is and all the junk, and how only, uh, only evolution can explain that, because under creationism everything would be perfect. But we see all this, this bad designs, these junky designs. They must have evolved because evolution is, after all, a blind process, and it just you know uh, it, it it creates a biological structures that are a claptrap, uh, just some, somehow managed to work. But there's all these problems. But then when you actually look at the details of biology, you find out how marvelous everything is and how well it works. And then evolutionists will say, yeah, well, evolutionists uh, evolution optimized that. So evolutionists are having it both ways. On the one hand, they argue that it's it's a, a, a unguided process that uh, creates junk, and then on the other hand, it optimizes things. Skipping down here, our hypotheses are still speculative and are supported by little evidence. Wait a minute, let's read that again. Our hypotheses are still speculative and are supported by little evidence. So again, back to the enigma, the problem, all that language at the beginning and in the PR piece where even evolutionists have to admit this isn't working. This is not solving the problem of how sexual reproduction evolved. So even in their conclusion, they have to make this sort of a statement. Our hypotheses are still speculative and are supported by little evidence. Now, if such fundamental questions remain in flux, are unanswered, are still a problem, how can evolution be a fact? What's the answer to that question? I want you to think about that. How can evolution, how can evolution be true? How can evolution be a fact? Religion drives science and it matters.